Have you ever had an experience so good, so incredible, so epic, so amazing, that you had difficulty trying to explain it to someone else? Right? Maybe you had an opportunity, maybe, maybe you travel, your family travels, and you've gone amazing places on vacation, you've seen beautiful beaches, maybe mountains, I don't know where you've gone, but then you gotta explain this to someone else, and a picture does not do it justice, does it? Maybe you've been to a concert where like thousands of people, and you're singing, and you're jumping, and you're dancing, and the energy is there, and it's electric, and you gotta come back, and someone goes, hey, how was the show? And you're like, it was amazing. Like, you, got, you don't even know. Like. They're not gonna understand that, right? You can show them, and they're, like, and, and they're like, yeah, well, you know, that was a great concert, but I saw that from YouTube. And you're like, YouTube doesn't even like compare to what it was like to be there. Uh, as I was thinking about experiences I've had, uh, one experience that is a crazy experience that is hard to describe to anyone was my first missions trip to Costa Rica back in 2013. Brianna was there, Shannon was there, and uh, the crazy experience we took was zip lining. Right? Now, I had never led a mission trip before, I had never been ziplining before, but we decided that on our free day, we would go ziplining from mountain to mountain in Costa Rica. And can I just tell you, I was terrified. We get to this place and it's called Fossil Land. And the guide sings us a song. Do you guys remember the song? Fossil Land where everybody dies. And they would tell us, oh, not yet, they would tell us about um, you know, hey, these don't work, don't be afraid. These zip lines, they can hold a bus. And then he pulls out a bus the size of my water bottle and hangs it on there and goes, see, it's great. Um, and, and it was terrifying. And it's hard to describe it. But I brought you guys a video. Let's, let's show that video. It's like a minute and a half. You guys get an idea of what this was like. Like, 
And then you notice as Christians, right, church people, we get kind of crazy about Christmas, don't we? We're like, this is like, if Easter is like the Super Bowl, I need some other sports analogy for Christmas. What is it? It's like the Taylor Swift era store. Sure. Um, maybe you like that, maybe you don't. But uh, look, we celebrate it because of this reason here. We looked at this verse last week. Check it out. John 1, verse 14. So the word became human and made his home among us. The word is Jesus. He made his home flesh and bone in our neighborhood. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we've seen his glory, the only, the glory of, of, of the father's one and only son. Right? This verse points us to Jesus. And um, maybe you've noticed that like, we get super into this idea of Christmas around here. Maybe, maybe you've heard church people explain, like, hey, it's because of the birth of Jesus that all these amazing things happen. That we know how incredible God is. Or we know how powerful God is. Or we can know how loving God is. Or we can know, like, there's all these reasons that, that God shows up. Um, and we can explain these things, but, like, does explaining it really help us, like, get it? Like, understand it, know it. And maybe you're hearing, like, hey, there's some reasons, like, there's some reasons, you know, you talk about this Jesus thing, but there's some reasons, like, I still don't get it yet. And I can think of, like, two big reasons in particular. The first one being, like, maybe you've encountered people who claim to follow Jesus, and their lives don't really look any different because of it. Now, uh, when I talk to a lot of people, Christians and non-Christians, one thing they often bring up is, hey, there's these other Christians, and why are they so hypocritical, right? They kind of put a bad taste about Jesus in your mouth. You know what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about like Christians who like sin. Like, we all sin, amen, right? Like, we all struggle with sin. We all, we're all overcoming. But there are sometimes some people who claim to follow Jesus, and yet their lives don't look transformed like the Jesus they claim to know. You know, they're mean. They're hurtful. They're judgmental. Their lives don't look transformed by Jesus. And so you say, man, if that's what Jesus is like, I don't know if I'm on board with that. I think another reason sometimes it's hard for us to get it, like get the joy and get the experience and, and get what this Jesus is about, is sometimes, like, let's be honest, life is hard. Life is ugly. Life is messy. Life is full of hurt. And it's, it's, it's full of, of crazy stuff. Like, I don't know what's going on in your week this week, but I bet you it hasn't been all like mountaintop sunshine and roses. I bet you there's been some hard stuff in your week. Maybe you know someone who's sick. Maybe you know someone who's struggling. Maybe that person struggling is you. So you're like, man, like, if life is hard, I, and God's supposed to be good and transforming things, I don't know where I'm at in all of this. So I think those are probably two big reasons why maybe it's sometimes hard for us to get it. When we talk about Jesus and how amazing this is, especially this season, and how transforming Jesus is, it's hard for us to get on board sometimes. No matter what you've heard, no matter what you felt, no matter what you've thought about Christmas before, I'm asking you for the next few minutes to just kind of tune in a little bit. Allow yourself to hear it fresh for the first time, to rethink it. And here's why. Christmas isn't just a fun story that we tell every year. It's history. Christmas story is real people from a long time ago, who had to learn how to trust God and, and follow him. People who had doubts and questions. People who were trying to figure out, how's God working in our world? And maybe that's kind of like you. God, what are you doing here? Are you showing up? How are you working? So it's more than just a story, it's history. The people in the story, as we're gonna to see today, they're not anything really special. They're ordinary people, sometimes less than ordinary people. And uh, especially, we talked about last week, after a period of silence between our Old and New Testament where God wasn't talking, God wasn't sending any prophets, I don't know what people were expecting from God. They knew the promises, a Messiah had to come, but God was quiet. Is he still going to show up? Is he still going to deliver? So as we read the story today from Luke 2, familiar Christmas story, I want you to rethink it. I want you to put yourself in their shoes. I want you to say, what if I was Joseph or Mary? What if I was a shepherd? How would I have responded? What would be going through my head? So let's let's start the story this way. Luke 2, chapter or chapter 2, verse 1. You can follow your notes, the page, uh, the page or, or, or on the screen. It starts this way. 
At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken where Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, King David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. If you don't know, that's in northern Israel. He has to travel to southern Israel. That's about a week's journey. He's got a pregnant Mary. It took longer than that, let me tell you. He took with him Mary, who was engaged, now expecting a child while they were there. So the time comes for the baby to be born. She gives birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Let me ask you as you hear this, if you were the God of the universe and you wanted to show up on earth and announce your presence to the world in flesh and blood for the first time, how would you do it? Not like that. <laughs> right? Not like that. Would you be an adult? You'd have thoughts and opinions? Maybe have some autonomy and power of your own? Or would you show up as a baby? Like... Would you be showing up as, as, a, as a ruler, a business owner, right? Or would you be showing up uh, needing a blanket and shelter from the cold? And so we see here when the God of the universe shows up as flesh and blood, he shows up as a baby, naked, small, helpless, completely dependent on others for survival. It's probably not how I would have done it, but that's how God does it. That's how he moves into the neighborhood, right? God shows up in the world the exact same way each one of us does, as a baby born. If you ever wondered if God knows you and if he loves you, if you've ever wondered if he understands you, if you ever wondered what does he know what it's like to live on this planet or walk a day in your shoes, like you can be sure he knows what it's like. Scripture tells us of all the human experiences Jesus had. <coughs> hunger and grief and thirst, pain. He knows what it's like. Scripture tells us he was tempted in every way, just as we are. So when a baby's born, what happens? Not biologically, right? I'm asking, like, what happens when babies are born? People get excited. People throw a party. They want to invite their friends. They want to invite their family. But here we have Mary and Joseph. They've got no one to invite. They're alone. So check out what happens next in the story, because this isn't just a story of King Jesus coming, but this is a birthday party. That night, verse 8, that night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. And they were terrified, because who wouldn't be? But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said, I bring you good news that will bring great joy for all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by the sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. And suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. This might be the biggest birthday party in all of history. The entire host of angels show up praising God, and they invite the local shepherds to this party. Come see what has happened. Right? Shepherds are an interesting choice for an invite because shepherds are kind of like the fringes, the outcasts, the outskirts of society. They're not in town. They're not with the rest of the people. They're outside alone. Their only other friends are sheep and shepherds. And people like look at the shepherds and they're like, yeah, you guys are kind of sketchy. You smell, you're dirty, you're unclean. Um, these aren't the normal people you invite to a party. And yet, they're the ones that God appears to and tells them the good news. And then the shepherds have this choice. But like this reveals us to us something amazing about God's character, doesn't it? It's that when God moved into the neighborhood, everyone is invited to the party. And that goes so against the way we think it should happen, doesn't it? That's not what I would invite. I don't know about you. The highest of angels to the lowliest shepherds, like, wow, God invites them. And the angels bring good news of great joy. I love that phrase. I love good news of great joy. I don't know what you've heard about God before. 
But if someone is telling you about God and you haven't heard about good news and great joy, they haven't told you the whole picture yet. So we see in the Christmas story that God's love is for all people at all times and in all places. And that's such good news for us. Like it wasn't just a thing that happened as an event only in history, locked to a time and place. This is good news for you and me today. We said last week that this Jesus changes everything. What's relatable about this story is that when the angels explained to the shepherds that what God was doing, the shepherds weren't just content to sit and hear about it. I mean, imagine, you sit in church every week, you hear about Jesus. Shepherds in their fields hear about Jesus. Angels disappear, they're like, okay, cool, time to go home, I guess. No, the shepherds say, we need to go inspect, investigate, check out this thing that has happened. Because, right, if God has done this, if God is like this, if God would show up and reveal it to people like us, we have to go see more. We have to experience this firsthand. And that's what they did. Check out how the story continues in verse 16. They, the shepherds, hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph. And there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. And all who heard the shepherd's story were astonished. But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Right? News of this amazing announcement stretched from the shepherds and then went far and wide. People couldn't imagine what the shepherds had encountered. I mean, we read it in our Bibles like, oh yeah, this is just what happens. This is not just what happens. This is extraordinary. And I don't know, like when you hear this account, this historical snapshot, what it does for you, if it makes you curious, if you're skeptical, if it fills you with confidence, you might be amazed. You might believe it like the shepherds did. You might say, I'm not so sure if I believe that yet. I don't know where you're at. But I think no matter where we land on this, we need to have that curiosity, that heart of the shepherds. We need to experience Jesus for ourselves. Right? We talked earlier in the semester about what it's like to own our own faith, to move beyond the faith of our pastor, our parents, our grandparents, our small group leaders, and own it for ourselves. And this is, this is part of that. This is a continuation of, of that idea and that story. So my encouragement for us tonight is to follow the shepherd's example. Do what they did, because Jesus is meant to be experienced, not just explained. And I want to unpack that. But Jesus is meant to be experienced, not just explained. There's this word experience. And when you hear it, it might draw up all kinds of ideas about what is an experience and what does it mean to experience Jesus. If you look up the definition of experience in the dictionary, you're going to get something like this means to participate in, to learn from experience, like hands-on time with, or to be moved by something. And so we have to think about it in terms of Jesus. If we're to participate in Jesus, that sounds weird, but stick with me for a second. What does it mean to participate with Jesus? Like, we have to ask ourselves the question, do we participate in Jesus and the things of Jesus? If we're going to experience him, 2 Peter 1.4 tells us that we are partakers of Jesus' divine nature. We're one with him. Okay, so I'm part of Jesus. I belong to Jesus. I encounter him. Do I also participate in the things of Jesus? What will we say are the things of Jesus? Well, okay, I can show up to church, be part of my small group. I can do, like, engage in Bible study and prayer and worship and serving. Do I put myself in those places? Am I participating with Jesus? Back up. I'm still on the last slide, guys. All right, do you learn to learn from experience, right? Ask the question. As you know and experience God's love, do you share it with others? Right? Jesus in John 15 said, abide in me and I in you will bear much fruit. Right? By spending time and learning from and knowing Jesus, this overflows to others. 1 John 4, 8 tells us we know what love is because we know God and he is love. And experience means to be moved by. we got to ask the question, how do we respond when the Holy Spirit prompts us? Jesus in John 16 says, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. He's going to come. He's going to counsel you. And he's going to 
show you what is truth, and he's going to convict the world of sin. In Galatians 5, Paul writes what it's like to follow the flesh versus what it looks like to follow the spirit. Are we moved by the spirit? Do we respond to him? So, you know, I can, I can tell you what it's like to zip line in Costa Rica. I can tell you all about my cool experience of camping in the UP. Uh, I can tell you about my trip to California. I can tell you about all these cool things I've done in my life, right? But until you experience things for yourself, like, you're never going to know what it's like. And I know that's a simple illustration, but I think, like, that's kind of my point tonight. Like, I can stand here and I can explain to you what Jesus is like, but do you know him? Do you have a relationship with him? Or is he just something you learn about when you come to church? How can you start to experience Jesus in your life? Maybe this season, today, tomorrow. Because we want you to have a real relationship with Jesus, something that's growing, something that's, that's, that's shaping you and directing you. That continues here and continues till you're in college and, and beyond. So as we think of how we can apply this today, I want to look at the example of some of the people in our story tonight, the shepherds and Mary, and see how did they experience Jesus. So, first thing we got to do, first thing we got to do is we got to show up or participate in, right? That was Luke 2, 15 through 16. The shepherd said, we have to go and see this thing that the Lord has told us about. It wasn't just enough to hear. We have to go and check it out. So what's your next step to showing up and checking it out with Jesus? Is it continuing to go to church? Is it actually engaging in your small group and not just sitting quietly? Is it spending time and fellowshipping with the people of God, not just at church, but outside of church too? Is it being part of winter camp? Maybe you're thinking, hey, that challenge conference thing sounded cool. But don't think showing up is just about what the church offers. You've got to show up to where Jesus already is. Spend time in your Bible. Spend time in prayer, worship, serving. Like, you already have a daily appointment with Jesus. It's up to you to keep that appointment. Are you going to show up? Are you going to participate? Secondly, you've got to share what you know. Right? Share what you know. See, the shepherds share what they encountered. They told everyone about what they experienced, and people were astonished at the news. When Jesus moved into the neighborhood, the angels, the shepherds, they celebrated. The good news was shared over and over with more and more people. So many people hearing this good news of Jesus. Are you sharing the good news of Jesus? You don't have to know everything to share what you do know. You can share, hey, this is how I know Jesus. This is how I follow Jesus. This is how Jesus shows up in my life. This is how I pursue him. This is how he gives me peace when the world is crazy. This is how he helps me live in, in spite of all that's going on. So invite people to know Jesus. Share his love with them and live like he did. And lastly, be moved. You know, this story wraps up with Mary and the shepherds, and it's just kind of this footnote, but there's this response to encountering Jesus. And I think when we hear about Jesus and we encounter him, it kind of demands a response. We have to do We can't just sit there and do nothing with what we've seen or heard. And so we have Mary, and she reflects. She ponders. It's quiet and introspective and prayerful. She thinks about, man, this is amazing what God is doing. It's not the way she would have planned it. But it's amazing. And then you have the shepherds, and they praised, and it was loud, and it was celebratory, and they shared, and they worshipped, and it was a big party. I mean, can you imagine going back to your flocks that night? Like, nothing is the same after that. Knowing Jesus demands a response. And I don't know about you, maybe this is your first time hearing the story of Jesus this way. Maybe this is your first time hearing about Jesus, and it just clicks for you. And you're like, I need to know more about this Jesus. You're talking about knowing him, experiencing him, following him. What does that look like? If that's you, I want to invite you. Talk to me. Talk to your small group leader. We would be happy to answer questions, talk to you more, help you take whatever that next step is for you. I want you to know that you can experience the love of Jesus, the presence of Jesus. I've experienced it. I want you to know him too. And discover, is Jesus who he says he is? That's where I want to wrap up tonight. As you guys head to small groups, I want you to be thinking about these things. Man, if Jesus is meant to be known and experienced, how am I showing up and participating with him? 
How am I knowing him and being known by him? How am I being moved by him? Is my life different because I know him? Let's pray and we'll go to Bruce. Father God, we can't encounter Jesus and stay the same. Father, for all of us in this room tonight, no matter where we're at, first time hearing, millionth time hearing, God, I pray that your word would penetrate our hearts, that as we hear about this Jesus, our curiosity would be sparked, that we'd be in awe and amazement, that we want to discover more, and not just words on a page, but a real relationship with a risen Savior who came as a baby who died to pay for our sins. God, that we would be changed by the message of the Christmas season. That you love us, that you know us, that you want us to know you too. Father, I pray for us as we head to small groups tonight. God, be with our conversation. Help us just to engage. If we're tired or we're distracted or whatever like burdens or baggage we've brought tonight, God, that we'd be able to just engage with each other, with your word, with our leaders, that we would grow, that we'd be challenged. God, would you do that tonight? Father, we love you. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.